Christian Springer, cinematographer for Atlanta. You were the DP for nearly the entire series, including all of season four, which returned to Atlanta after the European detour of season three. Um, and that had a lot of standalone episodes, but both seasons were filmed together after many delays. So just broadly speaking, what were your discussions like before filming began for both seasons and specifically for season four, knowing that you were going back to Atlanta and you will have to, you know, sort of reestablish the look of the show. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> because the show is created by Donald Glover and Stephen Glover, and they um, have some very deep ties to the music industry and to, you know, making and producing records we actually did sort of conceive a little bit of the show uh, musically the way that, that an artist would conceive different records. And so we kind of saw, um, you know, this sort of like freshman album as season one. We saw season two as sort of a darker progression. Uh, we saw season three as kind of the like wacky concept album. And then season four, we sort of conceptualized a little bit as kind of like returning to the hits and kind of like going back to our roots, but now in this like much more matured fashion. And also that's sort of the narrative of our main characters too, right? Is that they have sort of like seen the world and reached success and they're now kind of like uh, going through sort of existential uh, angst of what does it all mean and what's it all for? And, you know, you're going back to your hometown after after you know achieving what you think are your goals and and um so the, you know a lot of parallels to us making the show and what the characters were going through and so we we spent a lot of time trying to conceptualize and design what the look and feeling of season four was um with all that in mind mm -hmm. i i love that like and then knowing that like season four is the last one it's like you're just playing the greatest hits and yeah it's kind of it's actually really nice to know when it's your last season i feel like mm -hmm. uh donald you know went uh through five seasons of four or five seasons of community and they had very notoriously uh this sort of season end order for i think season three and that season was like the wackiest season because they knew they were done and and so I think he, from the get go, he always knew that we wanted to like know when we were going to end instead of just getting, you know, canceled by, you know, the numbers not being good or something. I think he knows that, uh, you know, it's better to quit while you're ahead. <laughs> but, uh, but no, it was really nice to, it was nice to be able to know that like, um, we can kind of design around that concept. Mm -hmm. And I know they uh wrote both seasons already so, like the scripts were ready before production began so what was it like having both sets of the season scripts ready it was nice so much time and prep yeah it was nice to be able to um to kind of see how it was all going to play out we we were a little unclear as in terms of like what the order was going to be um towards the back half uh and we ended up rearranging the back half order in post a little bit um but yeah, it was nice to know how the season was going to end. It was nice to know, you know, this episode in particular is kind of Alfred's sort of penultimate episode. And it was, it was, you know, we got that script very early on. So we had a lot of time to really think uh, and, and design what we wanted that to be. And we knew that it wanted to be special. We knew that it wanted to stand out from the rest of the episodes. Um, and, uh, from a cinematography perspective, there was a lot of, you know, like extra, uh, layers of, of nuance that, you know, I kind of got some extra time to think about adding, adding in. That was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're Emmy nominated for, uh, Andrew Wythe, Alfred's World, uh, like you said, the penultimate episode all about Alfred. And I think the, the show's best episodes are focused on him. Um, but in this one, he's, uh, on his farm. He just wants some peace and quiet. And uh, it's his safe space turns out not, to be not so safe in the end. But <laughs> yeah. I love like the the juxtaposition of like the the calm and serene he's seeking, and then it kind of turns into like a a horror film by the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. You know? so, so like, <laughs> and, and ultimately, you know, like very little yeah. dialogue too, which is you know yeah. a gift for any cinematographer. <laughs> So, so what was it like, you know, conceptualizing those two disparate uh, types of moods for the episode? You know, we didn't want to like lean too hard and project the sort of like you're saying the sort of more dramatic horror element. And so what we kind of talked about in prep was like 
just leaning in tr into the um, naturalism and the narrative surrounding him getting back into nature and him having this experience growing up in the city and, you know, going and living on a farm and, and also the sort of like loneliness that he isn't really expecting when he makes this decision. And so those were sort of, we were trying to steer it more in that direction. And then, you know, the horror elements could, could kind of arrive uh, or the more, uh, the scarier moments could sort of arrive a little bit more on and kind of expect it. We tried to like, you know, seed it in a little bit here and there, but we didn't want to like go to push too genre -y into, you know, something that, that projected what it was going to be. Um, I love the the juxtaposition of the sereneness of the farm and like the calmness that Alfred is seeking. And then there's some horror elements too by the end with the hog attack and everything, the tractor. So <laughs> how did you go about conceptualizing shooting those two disparate types of moods? Uh, we talked a lot about, you know, wanting to steer away from it being anything genre specifics, you know, in particular in the horror direction. And so we really wanted it to, uh, we wanted to focus more on like Alfred's connection to nature and to the farm and being someone that grew up in an urban setting and, and having this first experience kind of living out on the land by themselves. And so we tried to lean into a lot of that naturalism, you know, we shot a lot of dusk scenes and a lot of dawn you know sunrise scenes and uh you know we tried to not project that it was going to end up with these sort of more horror narrative elements um we tried to uh, keep it as kind of lean into the serene thing as as much as possible so that when those horror elements did show up they were some sort of unexpected mm -hmm. well the episode title is a reference to christina's world the very famous yeah. and there's a, a shot in the episode uh, that reimagines it when he's crawling to his house and it's it's kind of haunting because like you have the river in there and like it, it takes him so long to get there so how do you go about referencing a very famous piece of art like that but you know still making it your own somehow we we kind of had talked about we had talked about sort of references uh, in pre-production and we were sort of throwing out you know some like artwork and photography work and whatnot. And that image came up uh, and we were sort of just kind of like, I don't know, we were just sort of like inspired by, you know, this sort of serene and very beautiful setting, but there was also like a sense of dread and sorrow and sadness in it. And then when we were scouting, we kept lo loving this idea of like, what if we found you know, this like big, long, wide shot where Alfred was sitting in the um, in the foreground and you could see the house from far away, like the painting. And then we actually, we scouted for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then we found this, this location and we were like, this is kind of the, that exact image right here. And then that actually is kind of what led us to sort of choose that location. It ended up being really perfect for what the script, you know, sort of described, but um, yeah, it really was sort of serendipitous and, and we weren't necessarily looking for that shot, but uh, it was kind of the inspiration of that, that chose, that made, led us to choose that location. And, and then we were like, well, we got to get the shot now. So, um, but yeah, it was sort of, sort of, uh, uh, sort of luck. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Uh, well, one last thing quickly. One of my favorite shots is just uh, the after he kills the hog with the, the skillet, the next morning he's using the skillet to cook bacon. And I love that <laughs> you sort of like for a quick second think like, was that the hog? But yeah, then you have yeah. to think about <laughs> the bacon packet in the trash. So was that yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> something in the script that you're going to show that in the trash? <laughs> Uh, it was, yeah, th that was kind of the original idea, but we, I think in the script, it was a little bit more, uh, it was a pretty direct, I think it was like, you saw the bacon and then it revealed that there's like a package of bacon next to him. And so we, we were like, let's try to draw that out as long as possible. And if you look really closely when he throws it, uh, when he goes out and throws the trash, you can see like a little bit of some hog feet sticking out of the trash can, but we, you know, we wanted to be like very delicate with all that stuff to not, you know, a lot of the show is like not trying to like hit the nail on the head so perfectly every time. And we try to like, you know, bury that stuff a little bit deeper into the narrative and, and keep it all as much emotional storytelling as we can. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, Christian, it was great speaking with you. Congratulations again on the show and the nomination. And we still have a little bit.
Thank you so much. Igor Martinovich, cinematographer for George and Tammy. Uh, how familiar were you with George Jones and Tammy Wynette before the show? Uh, actually, I didn't know anything about, uh, about uh, uh, George Jones and Tammy Wynette. I, I did uh, I realize later on that I heard some of the Tammy's songs because they were like pop songs that I, uh, I've heard uh, in, the, in the background, but I didn't know anything about their lives. So it was kind of a process of discovery for me, uh, learning uh i watched like some documentaries about it i uh, after reading the script and uh and i also read some things about it i, I was looking for the references in terms of the uh, look of the period about the references of um, their performances and uh, so it was a it was a great process of discovery because i realized how this story is is basically a story of uh uh, it's 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 kind of like there is a dualism between it is because it's like universal drama uh, like between uh, two people that are, that are having hard time uh, uh, finding their ways together uh, living together and having hard time in fact living with uh, uh, themselves and their own demons and um, and more like romantic version of uh, um, uh, their public lives. Yeah, and their, their performances and so on. So, um, in that sense, it was it was interesting because that duality became like a concept uh, for cinematography. Because uh, um, I realized early that uh, if if you contrast these two uh, worlds, you can actually develop contrast in many ways visually. You, you visually, you can develop contrast as a contrast between natural and artificial light. Contrast between um, between uh, colors, complementary colors, or contrast between handheld camera and static camera, dynamism, static images. So, like, there's a lot of things that that uh, that came out of, of that uh, um, first uh, uh, impression. Mm -hmm. I I like the the aesthetic that you use because a lot of the shots there's something in the corner of the the frame so it kind of feels like you're spying on them and like these intimate moments like you're talking about and and they also feel kind of like trapped in a way because and then you feel like this you know in real life you know they had a tumultuous relationship and they just kind of didn't really know how to move forward and you know and like get better I guess you know for, for lack of a better term so how did you and like John Hillcoat the director go about developing that kind of visual language for it yeah, I mean, uh, the idea of like uh, uh, kind of um, spying or being being uh, participating in their life was enhanced by uh, using the foreground elements. So we would shoot through materials, um, uh, place elements in front of the lens just to kind of have that impression of uh, of uh, looking into their lives. The lenses would be tighter. Uh, sometimes we would embrace uh, reflections, the mirrors. Um, uh, shooting through the reflections and and uh, um, the idea was always to kind of like uh, be present uh, from the outside unless the, the moments uh, uh, call for where we, we are absolutely with them be experiencing the subjective moments with uh, with the, uh, with the characters and in terms of um, uh, 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 kind of we realized earlier that they are the victims of their own making and so like uh, the the way of representing that would be to to create frames within frames and place them within those frames inside of the actual frame so like so it would um it would suggest that there is no way for them to exit we would we would use a lot of negative framing putting them on the edge of the frame, uh, looking out of the to, towards the edge of the frame, off framing where they would be really low in the frame. So they're kind of drowning within the frame. So all those elements were uh, um, designed in order to kind of create a, a subconscious reaction to the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was a great observation. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're nominated for the second episode. Um stand by your man and there is a very interesting scene in this episode when George uh, buys a house without consulting Tammy and he brings her to the house and then the scene starts uh like we actually like see them through the leaves like you have the camera like a uh, spying on them like through the leaves and then you come to the house and it's like a, a lot of it are like wide and medium shots I guess but you see the house and it's like overgrown weeds 
So even though for a majority of the scene, there's not a lot of um, obscuration, like it's still, there's still kind of like an unease there with the, the weeds on the house. And it feels like they are kind of like isolated and they're, you know, kind of this is like their future a little bit but but it's 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 kind of bittersweet so how did you go about you know blocking and framing that particular scene I think I mean um the, the, um, at that moment Tommy wasn't 100% comfortable with the uh with the, the 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 entire concept of like new house moving in uh um and and so we we kind of tried to 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 look through the through her eyes and to to see this scene through the eyes so we would would keep the camera uh, perspectives kind of uh, um, um, grounded into her perspective. So if you would see her, we would see her close up, but when we would see George, we would see George over her shoulder. So it was always kind of being present through through her perspective. And uh, and uh, the, we slowly discovered the house. We didn't uh, open on the house wide, but we as as she she was going through the. Um, um, kind of like a wooded area to discover the house. That's how we discovered the house as well. That's how the audience how, uh, discovers the house because the subjectivity was like really crucial in, in, in the approach for this episode and for the entire series because we really wanted to ground this into some uh, into their own, into the uh, perspective of the characters. And, uh, um, and uh, we use different techniques to to uh, uh, to do that and also assigning different scenes to different uh, to to either George and Tammy. Mm -hmm. um, I know uh, Michael Shannon and Jessica Chastain sang everything live on set so what was it like shooting all of those music performances uh, with no pre-records? Uh, they were actually pre-recorded uh, but they were playing live uh, and uh, record uh, and uh, singing live on the uh, uh, while we were doing it, um, it was, I mean, it was almost like shooting a live concert, you know, like uh, you, you kind of had to be uh, open to uh, discovering things when, but completely prepared, like, you know, absolutely prepared to, to, uh, to, to be able to cover the scenes. I mean, we went, um, we found like really old lighting, uh, right from 70s, we, we, we put the new uh, LED lights within uh, into the housings of from the from the 70s. So everything had to be authentic, and had to be uh, uh, had to feel like we are part of the of the of that time period. We applied the grain uh, throughout the process through on set while we were shooting it. So the, uh, the idea was to uh, to to bring this uh, performance uh, uh, to the audience as. They would participate in being there in in uh, uh, in seventies. Mm -hmm. I also love like some of the the concert scenes where you're you're talking about you know the applying the different POVs to like there's some you know fans like obscuring the stage and sometimes it's closer and sometimes it's more distant, especially and it kind of also reflects like their relationship to fame and the trappings of fame. Right? Totally. Yeah. I mean, the the idea was that uh, um, the, uh, you know, using the foreground elements to 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 uh, um, to kind of be present at the concert as well. So if you're seeing, if you're at the concert, you don't want to see just there with them. You know, you want to see it where where you would be as an audience member. So you would have other audience members in front of you. So that was part of the of the of the of the concept as well. And. Uh, and generally, I think it it was the idea was to kind of like portray that fame as as uh, uh, as uh, because the music music was actually uh, the mirror of their lives. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to like incorporate that those kind of mirrors within uh, the uh, performances and within the film as as a, as as a, as an element that as we progress through the story the reflections and uh, uh, became distorted, they become broken, and the story as it progressed, like changed it into like much more uh, raw and uh, uh, non stylized or stylized in a different way stylized with like handheld uh, motion and lots of uh, grain and murky images and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, Igor, it was great speaking with you. Congratulations on the show and your nomination. And we'll see you back here in a little bit. Thanks so much. 
Anasis and Miko, cinematographer for Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities. Uh, this is an anthology series, and you're Emmy nominated for the third episode, The Autopsy, directed by David Pryor. Uh, what did you and David talk about, about making this episode your own while still having it fit under the grander umbrella of the series? Well, interesting enough, um, Guillermo didn't visit us at all on set. So his imprimatur came from not only the name, but uh, the commonality of production design, which was our same production designer throughout uh, all the episodes. And also he uh, was, you know, very much involved with David in the actual post process. Uh, David and I had worked together before, and so I already had a sensibility of what his proclivities were with camera movement and lighting. And um, Guillermo let us do our own thing. I mean, uh, obviously at the back of your mind, it is underneath the GDT umbrella. Um, so mm -hmm. certain color palettes, I'm subconsciously more than anything else were influenced by that. Um, but it's really David's you know, vision about what this story is. Mm -hmm. um, what what was uh, Guillermo's uh, reaction after you guys handed in the cut, since since he was so hands off during the process? Um, I, I think he was thrilled during dailies. I mean, we kept on getting, you know, quote, phone calls from the studio, uh, keep on doing a great job. So th that's always nice to have, you know, rather than the opposite, which is, uh, let's go revisit this scene. Um, we, you know, we yeah. shot it on a, obviously on an episodic um, schedule, so that didn't leave much time uh, for changing things. And uh, David uh, and I had really, as I said, we had worked together in the past, so I knew his ideas about camera movement and what he had wanted. And we had also spent almost three weeks in quarantine in Canada in the same building uh, in different apartments. So that led to a collaboration of its own kind right there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I did notice the camera movement in, in this episode, um, or in I think three instances when the, the camera just zooms in on an object. Like one of them is it zooms in on Nate's hands before we see the flashback of what happened like two months prior. And then you zoom in on, um, the, the back of Joe's head in the bar, and then you zoom in on Carl's head in, in the autopsy room when his hair is standing up. So can you talk about like how, how you guys decided on, on those camera movements for those uh, specific scenes? Well, the camera, uh, actually we didn't use any zooms. So what you're looking at probably is a dolly move. Um, mm -hmm. We were pretty much on primes all the way through, although I carried a couple of zooms uh, and kind of buried them in the move. The whole idea behind um, the type of, movement in the frame was to lend suspense. And it's also David's and my um, sort of taste where that camera has intent. Uh, and it's sort of an omnipresent intent that doesn't react to the actors, that everybody reacts within the frame at the same time. And by this, I mean, for example, if we were doing some sort of shot and an actor was blocked, rather than move the camera, dolly it left or right, or boom up to anything to open something up, David would just call cut and we'd redo the shot so that it makes sure that there was a clear choreography to and a formalization to what we were doing, um, which then, of course, drives the narrative because the audience is on board and understands that the camera is driving into a certain point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one. Um, well, one thing I love about this episode too was the lighting. And I feel like on uh, some other shows, like just because of the genre, uh, the episode would be darker, but I like how brightly lit some of these scenes were, or you could see like the contrast in the rooms, like in Nate's office and in the autopsy room, like you could actually see things. And then that was also, nice in contrast to the freezer, which is dark and dreary and icy and you get you, get, you feel cold looking at it. So what was uh, your goals with the lighting in these scenes? I guess it's kind of a, like a neo-noir approach. Mm -hmm. um, knowing it was going to be on television is one. It's very different than shooting a feature where you have far more control as to what the image is going to be when it's actually on a big screen, particularly now with DCP. Um, and so with television, um, it needed to be grounded in reality. It's an, it literally is an existential 
question about a dying man who's alone in the earth. Are we alone in the universe? And that's what, you know, that kind of genre of horror is so good at. But in order to be horrific, it has to dwell firmly in reality. Um, so you can't have an autopsy room that is not brightly lit because that's actually what's going on in there. You know, you have to have a sheriff's office. Yeah, I mean, he's got to see. And it, and it was a challenge to get that going because it's the last act of a 56 minute show. And, um, you know, we managed to have, you know, Murray turn on a practical as he walks in. But I knew that I was going to be married to this lighting for the next 13 minutes of screen time. So part of the challenge was to make it interesting when we first enter this room and still make it believable to go all the way through and carry the audience's interest and as much carry the intent of the drama and suspense. What I did was use the contrast of color as much as I did between contrast of luminance. So in order to get the kind of moodiness that we were looking for, um, I was certainly not afraid to use bold colors. And of course, you know, having Guillermo's little, you know, like I said, impractor in the back of my mind, it was like, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, GDT loves this. Why don't we keep on yeah. doing it? <laughs> well, there's uh, by the end of the episode, there's some gore, but not it's not overly gory when uh, Carl, you know, stabs his eyes and like slits his throat and everything. So how did you go about like the, the specific angles? Because a lot of them is you just see the top of his head uh, like when he's on the gurney. And then sometimes it's a bird's eye view. So how do you go about deciding uh, which how how to shoot that specific uh, specific scene when when he's stabbing himself and how gory to make it and like what to show and what not to show? The episode itself is not rooted in a splatter cut type of horror film. You know, this is not Texas Chainsaw. No. Um, where where it is the grand guignol of it all to go back to theatrical terms as to what the audience feels and perceives. You know, it's I mean, it's far less gory than than Tarantino stuff, for example, in terms of the blood splatter. And part of that was is again to try and and keep it grounded in a reality. I mean, there is a man that's going to commit suicide because he wants to save quote the world, end quote, uh, in a re very real sense. Um, and Murray also brings forth the humanization of a character. And what I mean by that is much of the camera is also feeding off of what the actor's giving us, because in a, particularly in a strong genre sense, um, once the character is humanized, he's afraid of cutting his own eye. He's afraid of slicing his own ar artery. Or wouldn't we all be? So the timidity that he was showing was also lent to how we were going to feel. Mm -hmm. I, I love like you, you feel like, you know, like, you know, he's going to sacrifice himself and you feel like his hesitation, but he goes through with it. And then I love um, his conversation in his mind, I guess, with, with the, the parasite and how he's a lot more authoritative because he knows like he, he beat him, so to speak. And so how, how did you go about, you know, building that? those scenes in the mind, I guess, I, I'm assuming you're working with like VFX as well of what you wanted to show in those scenes. Yeah, very much so. Although, I mean, you know, David and I chatted a lot about it with VFX. Um, the thing about working with VFX, it's always, and even with preview and all sorts of concept renderings until you actually feel it and see it, it doesn't have its own life. Um, so a lot of it had to do with the three of us sitting around and, and trying to figure out what it is that we were going to see months from now when they finally had it all. And how was that going to fit in within my lighting and our own camera sensibilities? Uh, and David is really very adroit at explaining and very facile with language. So it was easy to get into his head. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, well, Anastasia, it was great speaking with you. Thanks so much for your time and congratulations again on your nomination in the show. Thank you so much. See you in a bit. See you in a bit. 
I'm David Mullen, cinematographer for The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. If you've been on the show since the pilot and now the you know show's over, fifth and final season, but one of the cool things about the final season, uh, I thought were the flash forwards through the decades into the future. And I, but what was your reaction when you found out about them and how did you go about creating different looks for them as well? Well, we got um, outlines for each episode in advance and before the script showed up. So I started to see these flash forwards and a few flashbacks, which we've had in the past, but uh, these flash forwards are kind of a new thing. And there were a lot of them. Um, the first episode of the, of the season was this flash forward to the 1980s when you meet uh, Midge's grown up daughter in a psychiatric session. And uh, so I started to think about uh, how we were going to differentiate these uh, visually. And we couldn't do anything too stylized because they're still part of the timeline of the story. It wasn't, it couldn't be uh, strange or, or too abstract. Plus there were so many and so many eras, uh, you'd run out of kind of approaches very quickly. But uh, my general idea was to reduce the amount of diffusion so that the, the as we got to the present day of the 2000s, things would get cleaner and sharper and look a little more just straightforward. Um, so we switched up mostly the filtration. We normally shot the film, the show with a certain amount of Hollywood black magic diffusion. And then when we got to these flash forwards, we'd play with other types of filters. Uh, so there was still a little bit of diffusion, but it was a different type. So we shot that psychiatric scene with a low con filter and we settled on a glimmer glass filter for most of the flash forwards. But by the, the final episode, when we got to the 2005, the, the latest, we. Um, we pretty much went filterless. We just shot as clean as possible. Yeah, it, it felt um, in every one of the flash forwards felt kind of it, like modern, but also kind of old timey a little bit. So it's kind of like, a, you know, still still like vestiges of of like the 60s and 50s Maisel we're used to. Yeah, so. it's it's tricky because the show, the present, the story time of the show, we've always had a kind of vibrant, energetic, colorful mm -hmm. look to it. So it seems strange, but we actually, some of the flash forwards were actually less saturated than the 1960 era of the main timeline because to go anywhere visually, the only place we could go is the opposite direction, which was towards less color. And the storyline, it made sense because things were sadder or there were, you know, Joel in prison in episode five. Uh, uh, there's a lot of reasons to pull back on the color, mm -hmm. um, particularly the Lenny Bruce opening for ep the final episode. Yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, well, you're nominated for the series finale, Four Minutes. And uh, I mean, the, the centerpiece of that episode is obviously Midge's uh, segment when she hijacks the remaining four minutes on the Gordon Ford show and she does her set. And um, as she's doing her set, the, the lighting also changes to harken back to the gaslight because um, the Gordon Ford set is kind of pastel-y, like typical talk show lit. And then you get this like 360 kind of dim look like the gaslight. So what were the logistics of creating that callback? Well, that was uh, an idea that Amy had. Um, she asked me if we could make the room feel like the gaslight basically with lighting. And uh, be being a theatrical TV studio environment, obviously we could. Um, the question in my mind was, th is this dimmer cue meant to be there for reality or is it just a kind of fantasy moment? Because um, the problem is that we, we always cover the stand-up with multiple cameras and then we cover it with a single camera. And we had planned this big 360 degree move around her uh, for that, that moment. Um, but we were also covering everyone's reactions. We were, uh, we would shot that same performance with multiple cameras. Uh, and so I never was hundred percent convinced that the editor might not change their minds and use other angles for that final monologue uh, for that moment. And so I had to do that cue in every angle, like every reaction shot on Abe and Rose. Uh, I had to do it on Joel's reaction shot, on Gordon Ford's reaction shot, to just because otherwise it seemed odd to me if they did cut away that you would go from this dark gaslight like lighting on her and then everyone's still in the bright studio lighting that would be more jarring I think so I just decided to recreate that cue on once we programmed it into the board um, we more, more or less ran it on every time we got to that same moment we ran it on wherever the camera was pointed so so but um, luckily Amy was pretty uh, con uh, set on doing it in a single shot 
uh, mm -hmm. 360 degree move. So, uh, and that's what we, we committed to. We actually did it twice because when we did it, we spent a week shooting that final four minute sequence because it was so many, unlike our normal style, that, that sequence had a lot of cuts. We had to do reaction shots on everyone throughout the whole sequence. And we didn't want to shoot like all of Abe's reaction shot on one day and do like 12 pages of off-screen dialogue and him reacting to that. So every day we would shoot the section of the script and then we'd shoot everyone's reaction to that section of the script. So I had to go back and to the audience and, and keep recreating the lighting on Joel, on Archie, on Rose and Abe, uh, because we would always go back every day to their reactions. So um, we did that 360 degree move, but we had a little bit of a technical glitch with our Steadicam. We had done a very fast Steadicam move in, in Midge's hallway in her apartment, running backwards. And we we ran into a wall basically with the camera and we caused a little bit of a, a jitter in somewhere in the post of the Steadicam. And we kept, all week we were swapping out the arm, the head, the every control piece on the Steadicam, we kept swapping out, trying to get rid of this tiny little sh shimmer. And we were, you know, thinking, well, maybe we could get rid of it in post with a little stabilization. But um, so we did that 360 degree shot the first time. There was a, every now and then a tiny little jitter. Oh, um, and we were sitting there going like, well, maybe I can fix that in post. But it's such a, it needed to be such a perfect shot. Mm -hmm. It couldn't have anything distracting in it that um, Jim McConkey begged to to do it again, the R operator. And, and, uh, and Rachel was more than happy to have another pass at it she liked doing that that yeah i mean she line. she nailed it so yeah well, she, she mailed it over and over again day, you know <laughs> two days in a row and uh she uh was brilliant so she didn't mind doing it one more time and we did came back the next day and and uh fixed everything on the steady cam and, and it was perfect and i had actually slightly improved the lighting too because once i'd done it once the day before i said well this light here should cue up a one beat later and this light shouldn't be on yet when we come around to it because I was you had some practice so yeah you know. I practiced it I was yeah. trying to keep it constantly backlit so because it's 360 and it's constantly crossfading one light after another light after another light as we circled her um so it was it was fun to when we we I basically lit it uh the week before a few days before we shot it as a proof of concept and and showed it to Amy um, the other tricky thing is the gaslight is always smoked and hazed and the Gordon Ford set isn't. So that shooting day, I had to slowly add haze into the TV studio in order to have the effect once the lights switched over. And so you can see some haze building up that we tried to correct a little bit out in post. Although ironically, because we reshot it again the next morning, I could have spent the whole day before not doing the haze. Um, although I would have had the same problem with the multiple cameras uh, running on that one moment. So, uh, but yeah, it was, it was all Amy's idea to do that, that lighting cue. She just wanted the feeling of the gaslight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, well, I think fans appreciated it. Cause I think once the lights dim, like they all, every fan just knew instantly. It's like, it's a callback to the gaslight and they loved it. So, uh, but there's, there's another one or, or like 360 move in, in that whole scene when Midge first like eyes the mic and she decides she's going to take it. And then yes. the camera goes around and the mic comes in focus at one point. And then the focus shifts back to Midge. So what yeah. was it like shooting that? And did you have that same issue with the, the recalcitrant steady cam? <laughs> no, we, well, the, the, the problem with the steady cam was very subtle and it, it basically didn't show up on that particular shot, but um, it was very elaborately staged. Uh, it sort of starts where Midge gets called off her stool um, once they cut to commercial and she goes over to her parents and the camera follows her over to her parents, then there's a little bit of coverage, but then the master on the steady cam continues as she leaves her parents, um, sees the microphone and circles around her, then crosses over to get Susie and brings Susie over and lands into a two shot. Um, and so that was all in, in Amy's blocking and she wanted that moment all in one shot. Uh, and of course, as soon as we circled the mic, I asked her, do you want us to pull focus to the mic? You know, that's a more obvious statement than if we didn't pull focus to the mic, but she liked the idea of pulling focus to the mic. And then it was a little tricky for the uh, Anthony, our focus puller, because on a steady cam, there are no marks. So the steady cam may be six inches from that mic or might be eight inches from that mic on each take. And, and he would sort of see it come into frame and, and nail it. But uh, so it was 
complicated lighting wise that whole sequence because that tv studio is lit like an old tv studio with a lot of tungsten fresnel lights in the grid because in case i ever saw them i wanted to make sure they were period correct right uh but because that sequence had normally this this the set is lit for a stand up at the mic and the desk area and the band area but they were playing their scene on the stools in between the mic and the desk area and then midge was walking over to my car station and back to the by the band and then crossing back to the stools. Um, so I had to go with a softer light because I needed uh, the actors just have more room to, to move in different positions. So I couldn't have a bunch of hard spotlights on 30 different positions. So I switched the key lights to these sky panels. So there was a little bit of a softer effect um, that had more spread. So. Um, so they had more freedom to move, but I still needed to flag it off the curtains and stuff. So otherwise the room would get very flat looking. So my um, key grip, Charlie Sherry, I had to build a giant teaser for all the sky panels to, to keep them teased off the curtain and things like that. So it was, took some lighting for that final sequence. And then we were there for a week. Uh, yeah, well, it all sequence. looked incredible. Uh, well, David, it was great speaking with you. Uh, congratulations again on, on five seasons and your nomination again. Uh, we'll see you back in a little bit. Sean Porter, cinematographer for The Old Man. You worked on four episodes of the first season, including the pilot. And pilots, they have the responsibility of basically setting the tone of the show. So what were your aims for the visual language of The Old Man? Um, that's a good, that's a great question. Uh, aims is interesting because I think that, I think it's less when I approach a project that I'm going to apply something to it. I don't come to a project and say, oh, this story needs this, and then put a layer of, of cinematography on that and send it out the door. I think it's it's always discovery. It's always, it's kind of like listening more than talking. So I didn't, and for that reason, when I'm uh, approached for a project or start talking with a director about a project or a producer, I sort of try to stay away from references. Sometimes we'll bring them up on, in a technical sense, but aesthetically, I kind of want to arrive there and I don't want to, uh, to make any sort of preconceived ideas about what it should be. Cause I think I can kind of get in the way of, of something that I hadn't thought about before. Um, and John certainly had a lot of ideas about the way he wanted to approach the work that, um, that again, could have been, if I came at it being like, I know what this is supposed to look like, then there could have been um, discrepancies or conflicts that were completely unnecessary because that was just manufactured by like my ego or some of my, what I think I know about cinema. Um, so I think I came into it really open-minded. It was unique working with John on that. It was the first time working with, with John Watts and, and I just, uh, I guess it was like a two-hander. On the one hand, I just uh, finished a pilot uh, called Generations and with the Barneses, with um, Dan and Zelda Barnes. And uh, that was my first time working in television at all. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of came with its own stigmas and, you know, just I've been avoiding it, but really, again, for no better reason, except that some sort of you go at part of me was like motion pictures or or some sort of a higher art form and then you realize like oh wow all of the filmmakers I like and I, I want to work with are moving to television so what does that tell you uh so I kind of had to just changed my brain a little bit about that and but the Barneses were extremely hands-on loved really deep prep and they loved references and you know we would meet often just sitting around a glass of wine talking about characters and motivations and oh it would be cool if we did this and that and and so it was just very deep and with John uh so I was coming out of this experience and like okay well yeah okay I could try try television again <laughs> uh but maybe just the pilot at first I kind of just agreed to do the pilot the first two episodes I think with John um and, and it was a completely different experience. I think John, on the other hand, had come, just finished, I think, the second Spider-Man, and he'd already done one of these giant tentpole 
films prior prior to that. Uh, and so he was, I don't want to say that he's mechanized it, but to a certain extent, there's so much information that has to be conjured and disseminated on a film that large that he tends to just kind of hire the people he he wants for the project and trust in them, let them do their job because he's got a lot of other stuff going on. And so there, there wasn't that like, you know what, I remember the first couple of weeks of prep, I'm spending most of my time with the AD and going over the schedule and thinking about how this whole thing was actually going to happen. And I was starting to get nervous. I was like, aren't we supposed to, you know, am I supposed to sit down with John and start looking at movies and talking about stuff and looking at pictures and, uh, and that just never really happened. And that was, yeah, I was pretty terrified actually, because I felt like the stakes were really high with this particular project. And, um, and it really, you know, he had done, because of Spider-Man, he was used to um, a very robust automated previous situation mm -hmm. for himself. And so he had done a, it's essentially a 3D mock-up of the first episode in lieu of boards. And I think that um, it was really inspiring on one hand, because you get to kind of get a much more in-depth possibly perspective on what John had in his head in terms of camera movement at the same time it's far less fluid than boards and it's sort of like well once that's done unless you're keeping that team of previous artists on um it's sort of a one-off thing so it's it can't change really <laughs> and so I always saw that is a you know I had to sort of take it with a grain of salt on the one hand, it's like, well, we're not going to, we're not, I don't think his intent is to recreate this I identically um, or make a facsimile of it. He wanted to um, show people what he thought the tone, the pacing and general structure might look like. So we kind of, I, I remember it, we sat down, me and Dan Schatz and some other producers, we watched it once and that was it. I never saw it again. <laughs> so there was very little in that sort of really traditional robust prep that I'm kind of used to right. and traditionally fond of. So I was like, oh gosh, I mean, we're just going to, there's gonna be a lot of stuff that we're figuring out like in the moment. And, um, and I remember the first day we were tech scouting in the, in the house in, um, and where there's all the opening sequence takes place. And I just remember uh, John and I just sort of starting to bat stuff around and it was really fluid and it was really easy. It was really exciting. And he's always looking for somebody to, um, you know, it can be intimidating to work with somebody who's kind of like, oh yeah, I just did Spider-Man. Um, and so you, but you want, you, like, he didn't have me show up to just do what he asked. He, uh, he has me here to elevate his work, you know, the same that I'm asking him to elevate mine. And, uh, and so I'd push back on stuff I didn't, I didn't vibe with or, and, and I think he, you know, when it's done in an intellectual way or in a, in a, in a way that clearly has some pull relative to the story, that gets him excited and gets him moving. And, and so that first tech scout, we, we really created a lot of the aesthetic that we would carry on then later in the show. And, and like the things that, like we kind of joke about this old man pan sort of idea. This, I, I love the, the pans. Like, well, in, in the pilot alone, like there's one where you just kind of panning, it looks like you're approaching the door and then it turns and it's the microwave, the, yeah. burger, the microwave. And then there's another one when he's talking to, the Dan is talking to the cops on the porch and you pan to the door and it turns. And even at the end, after the fight behind the car, it turns and you see like, who's like at the door. And it kind of reminded me of like, it makes you feel like a CIA agent yourself. Cause you never know what's around the corner. Right. Absolutely. And you, yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things that it starts as this sort of guttural reaction you're like on this guy like oh it'd be kind of cool if like he leaves frame and then we're just like really slowly catching up and you haven't done all the math in that moment again you're kind of relying on your past experiences uh what you what you think the story is um and but then once you sort of decode those decisions later i mean post-rationalization is so much fun but you start to oh that's probably like that had a lot to do with it and i think that for me, there was a couple layers there. One, yeah, there's this idea of you never know what's around the corner and um, and everything's like not quite the way it seems. And then layered on top of that, you have this like ex-CIA guy who has been out of the game for a really long time at this point, like 30 something years or 
and um, and he's dormant. His mind's dormant. He lost his wife even, you know, seven, 10 years before that. So there's a, there's a reluctance to everything that happens in that first, you know, 15 minutes of the show. And it's, it's like this unwillingness to even get out of bed. And it's starting, it's very literal with, with him waking up and like, Oh, I got to start my, my morning routine. But the camera just completely assumes that role as well. We're right there with him. We don't want to get out of bed. We don't want to, you know, <laughs> go through the morning routine. He's sort of stuck in his ways and things have have been okay that way like he's suffering you know he's had he has a some significant losses that that we're going to deal with later in the show but um in the beginning it's like you're this old creaky uh trunk that just hasn't been opened in several decades and so you're just like trying to lift the hinges hinges are all rusty and everything's just like i don't want to move there's a there's an element of that it, it takes too much effort yeah like yeah everything's taking better. too much effort than it should and yeah. And that was really exciting once we sort of latched onto that. And then even later, this again, is an interesting project because at this point, because all the delays in COVID and, and Jeff, it, uh, I mean, we shot that almost four years ago. But um, something that only occurred to me more recently is, you know, later in the series or even in that um, episode, we introduced um, his his wife who's deceased. and we're never overt about it, but I think there is a little bit of a ghostly presence there in that house. And, and she sort of follows him around throughout the show. And upon revisiting some of those, those early compositions, it struck me. And and interestingly, I think it struck John about the same time uh, that, that this was sort of a ghost POV. It had, had POV elements. It was slightly voyeuristic and I couldn't put my finger on exactly why like nothing screamed voyeuristic in the traditional sense but there was something about those frames and often putting in frames within frames obviously kind of helps that idea but you know he's a little he's a little boxed in he's a little reluctant and he's being watched and I think that yeah. that um that plays twice once as as his wife now a ghost haunting him and two uh as this impending doom like this bad news that's heading his way is also creeping up on him and he's not ready for either of those two things yeah that's why uh well it's it's you know great work on the series especially the pilot and sean it was great speaking with you thanks so much for your time and congratulations again on the nomination thanks john joppin cinematographer for schmigadoon uh, you joined the show in season two so were you a fan of season one and what excited you about working on season two which went into the 60s and 70s of iconic musicals yeah, well, um, season two, um, it's much darker and grittier than season one. And also there's many more looks within it. Whereas season one was so, uh, sort of this one time period and was very sort of bright and, and arguably a little bit flatter than I usually like to do. So actually when I was approached to do the show, I wasn't sure that I wanted to do it. But when I met with them... <laughs> I mean, I loved the show and I loved the music, but it wasn't a look that I wanted to explore. But um, when I met with them, uh, they showed me these beautiful mood boards and, and sets and costumes. And, you know, they started talking about uh, Chicago, Cabaret, Umbrellas of Cherbourg, all these amazing films. So uh, halfway through the meeting, I was like, I won't do this. I hope they uh, I hope they decide to offer it to me. So, yeah, it was um, yeah, it was a great experience. You're, you're like uh, past me that was that was a mistake you should have not tried to turn this down right <laughs> like yeah no kidding well I think it's 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 always important to meet people and see what they have to say about it because you can I mean and honestly when I read the script the script was really fun too I mean what you don't get when you read the script is because there's there's so much music in it you don't get to hear the songs and you don't get to see the performances and I Honestly, once you see that, it was just so much fun. It was just so inspiring. Like we, we wouldn't really, we wouldn't go to rehearsals because it was COVID and they, they were cramming even more songs into the show. So we'd only get to see things in the morning and it usually you'd see it in the morning and you'd have all these options, you know, programmed in and ready to go, but you would just get so inspired. It was just so much fun. And, and um, mostly, um, mostly they were performing live for about 80% of it, the music's live. So it's like the energy and 
I mean, uh, yeah, it was a pretty amazing experience. Yeah, well, well, like you said, like the season is kind of darker, edgier. I like that you're you're more drawn to like murder and. <laughs> well, <laughs> like these, you know, I think all, as the DP, you want to you want to challenge yourself, and you 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 know right. when you take a project, you know what you're going to get to do, and you know you're going to be on it for five six months. You're like, I want to be challenged. I want to be able to to bring something to it. So, I think that's mm -hmm. uh, that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, and also like unlike season one, like in season two, there are kind of three distinct worlds. Like you have Chicago and then there's like the the Sweeney Todd world yeah. and then like the Hades. So how did you devise yeah. the look of each of them? Well, um, right from the beginning, Cinco Paul, he's, uh, he's an amazing showrunner. He actually comes from animation. He wrote Despicable Me and Minion and he's got a, he knows exactly what he wants. And he came in and he came in really hot and strong and he said, I want a three strip Technicolor look. And um, I didn't know that much about three strip Technicolor at the time, but you know, it's about, uh, they shot with three different uh, film stocks and they were different colors. So the colors are very discreet. And because of that, they're very vibrant. Funnily enough, um, I reached out to a lot of friends uh, to help me. And one of the people, David Mullen was, was really great in, in educating me about Technicolor. And um, so they, they wanted that look, they wanted this Technicolor look so that was kind of the umbrella for all the looks. So we developed this lot. I worked with the colorist, Jill Bogdanowitz, who's amazing. She designed a lot that we work with. So because it was tricky with the looks too, because even though we had the hippie camp, we had Sweeney Todd and we had Chicago and you know the cabaret kind of look, they all merged. Like all the characters would come together. So it needed to be different, but yet feel kind of the same. But you know, with the hippie, when we were in the hippie camp, we did... Um, it was very colorful and we, we did these rainbow flares and uh, it was great. And then, you know, the Sweeney Todd was darker and and more more ominous, more like the film. But um, the one thing as Seiko told me, he, Lauren Michaels had said to him, he said, you know, it needs to be dark, but it can't be too dark because it's got a really nice sort of light, fun tone to it. So mostly it was walking the line between being dark and not going too far so it was just finding that balance and and in the end I mean I, I ended up I, I was really happy with where we got to and I think showrunner in the studio everyone was pretty happy with it so it was a good marriage yeah yeah for sure uh well you're Emmy nominated for something real and this episode it kind of you know has everything that you just talked about you have like a a, you know a, a dance number a, a performance number at the hippie yeah. commune and then at the end Sweeney Todd with a uh, Alan Cumming, Kristen Chenoweth, but I'm gonna talk about like one shot um, at the yeah. the dinner scene because it's so understated, and it's oh, uh, Josh and yeah. his double date with um, Miss Cobwell and Dooley, and they're just sitting in a booth around this tiny table, and the camera is just perched in front of them the entire scene. And you've got like waiters crossing in front, and the bar yeah. in the back, and it, it's so simple but effective. So what went into the staging of that? Well, that, that's really, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because that's a really interesting story. And it's a story where, you know, you start on a show and you get to know each other. And that was the shot that built my incredible trust into Cinco Paul, the showrunner. And as soon as we did that scene, I'm, I'm like, anything he says, I'm doing it because he just knows exactly what he wants. So he came and we were really under the gun. Like we were very tight for time. So if you look at the scenes, like especially the performances, they're covered very economically we get exactly what we want. So he came to us the day before and it was one of those typical things where we were under the gun and he said to us, you know, I think it would be great if we could do this, this scene in one shot. And uh, so we started uh, talking about it. Robert Lekedic, the director and I, we started talking. We're like, hmm, I don't know. It's like, I think it's uh, almost two minutes, the scene. And he said, um, yeah, he wanted to do it in the one shot. So we're like, well, what do we do? Are we gonna dolly around the table? How are we gonna make it interesting? So we said to him, you know what, we'll do it in one shot. And, and if we feel like we need more coverage or whatever, we'll do that. So when we got there, he, he said, you know, it's not at all about moving the camera. It's about seeing everyone in the frame because you've got Alan Cummings and Kristen Chenoweth. They're right in the foreground that they're what the story's about right at the moment. They're trying to, uh, uh, Keegan and Cecily are trying to get them together as a couple. So they're in the foreground. It's quite awkward. And you have, uh, Cecily and King in the background looking. So you see their reactions, you see everything that's going on. And honestly, I don't think that scene would be that funny if you were cutting to people because you get to see everything that's happening in the frame. And um, 
yeah, it was just a good lesson. I mean, I think it's like, yeah, you don't need to be fancy all the time. Sometimes you just want to see what's happening. Yeah. On the other hand, too, you need incredible production design. You need uh, a great story and you need great actors who have the timing and, and can pull that off. So, so actually, I felt like I was cheating a lot on the show just because the production design was amazing. The costumes were amazing. The performances were incredible. It was like one song after the other. So, yeah, it's a really, uh, really special thing to work on. Yeah, like sure. Uh, well, yeah. well, on that note, do you, do you have a favorite song from the season? Mine is um, Good uh, Enough to Eat. Yeah, that's one of my favorites too. And, I, you know, I've watched it a lot too. And I think um, I just love the one thing that I got from the show is it's not just the people who are singing, but it's the people reacting to the singing and dancing. Like if you watch Keegan Michael Key, if you watch his face, he's just like, it's a masterclass in acting if you see how he reacts. But that whole scene with all the kids, oh, yeah, it was really special. Really, really special. That's one of my favorites. And then, um, I really like Talk to Daddy, which is in the in something real episode in the hippie camp. It's just there's something just kind of bonkers and it's very it's very Bob Fosse and it's um I don't know if you know the movie Sweet Charity, which mm -hmm. uh but it's based on that on that film. And uh it's funny the production designer Jamie, she said to me, you know, when you watch that film, she goes, You'll see where they got the inspiration for Austin Powers. It's got that sort of yeah zany kind of vibe so yeah it was just a lot of fun it was so fun even though it was a lot of hard work it was challenging with COVID we you know um it was just uh, so much fun going to work every day and, and the music was stuck in your head all the time which was uh, was really fun yeah awesome yeah. uh well John it was great speaking with you thanks so much for your time and you get to stay on because everyone's coming back so <laughs> thanks thanks for having me appreciate it yeah. Welcome to our Meet the Experts Cinematography panel. We're joined today by Emmy nominees, Christian Springer from Atlanta, Igor Martinovich from George and Tammy, Anastas and Mikos from Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities, M. David Mullen from The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Sean Porter from The Old Man, and John Joffin from Schmigadoon. Thank you all for being here. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations on all of your Emmy nominations. And uh, just quickly, what what was it like when you found out uh, you were nominated? Uh, Anasta, earlier, you, you said you were on your boat. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, there's a strike going on and uh, a boat is as good a place as any to be. So it wasn't until I got within mm -hmm. cell phone range and uh, a phone blew up. So it's um, it's a real honor to be counted among these amazing, amazing cinematographers. Yeah, I'm just in awe of, in awe of everybody here. Mm -hmm. uh, Christian, how about you? Um, I have a young uh, child running around rampant in my house right now, so I had completely forgotten that nominations were coming out and and uh, was totally surprised by it. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was super, super fun uh, way to start the day and, and uh, yeah, huge, huge honor to be amongst all these incredible DPs. Mm -hmm. Uh, Igor, how about you? Uh, yeah, I was uh, actually on a set uh, in Mexico in the desert, so my phone just got buzzing, and uh, you know I was kind of focusing what was in front of me. But yeah, uh, it was great to 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 receive the call, and uh, it's great to be part of you know this amazing group of cinematographers. Uh, Sean, it's a privilege. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, it was a it was a shock. I live in. Oregon so I kind of escape LA and all of that stuff when I'm not working so I, I of course was not tuned in or had any idea what was going on and yeah my agent sent some cryptic message at you know yeah like eight in the morning it was great <laughs> <laughs> cryptic I like that uh David yeah it was uh, a bit of a surprise uh you know the, I, I've been nominated every season so I didn't expect to get a nomination for the fifth season but um I was very very, very happy to to get it. Uh, my wife told me, I remember it was the nominations coming out that morning, but I was busy online doing something else. Or, and then suddenly I get a text from my wife who's in the next room saying, here's the nominations. And, you know, so. Uh, yeah, you've won five for five. Yeah, like, you know, not not many people can say that for the whole series, so. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was not quite an honor. Yeah, uh, John? Um, I, well, I had a call from my agent, which was quite a surprise, given that we're in the middle of a strike and there's not much work happening. So it was nice to hear from him. And yeah, like what a what a pleasant surprise. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm just honored to be nominated. And I've seen all of the shows. I've seen everyone's work. It's just beautiful. So 
uh, it means a lot. And uh, yeah, to be considered amongst everyone else, just just amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm, I'm curious how you guys kind of start uh, on, on a project or just like an, an episode even, but like when you first read a script, like how quickly uh, do you picture in your mind how you're going to shoot a scene or approach a scene or like start a shot list or does it kind of vary from script to script? Um, Igor, let's start with you. Um, I mean, I think it's a process of discovery. It's uh, you. It's really about like trying to understand the the, the narrative, what is going on, whose perspectives are we presenting. Uh, um, you know, trying to find the 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 look together with the director and trying to find the uh, the, the approach, overall approach, developing a concept. Uh, it takes time. It really takes time, and it takes like uh, lots of conversations, lots of exchange of images. Uh, uh, John Hillcott had like over 3,000 images as references that I had to come through and figure out what do I can relate to. So it was a, it was a long process, but it's a, it's a beautiful process. I love being in, in pre-production. Pre it's amazing. Mm -hmm. My favorite part. Yeah. Uh, Anasis, how about you? Um, for me, I think it depends if I've worked with a director or not before, because when you work with a director, you have a shorthand. And that shorthand really cuts through the process very quickly, because uh, we all know, we tend to know what we're not into, you know, um, because we've done that part and we know what those proclivities are. Um, but it, like everybody, it, it's all about reading the script and what are the first images in my head. Most of the time, I just read for story. I mean, when I first get a script, I just read pure narrative. I mean, just, you know, it's it's until you see for myself, until I see the actual locations and the sets and all of that, it it literally to some degree lives in this nebulous ND background of, of other films that I've seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, David, how about you? Well, if it's a project I haven't done before, it's a new project. I mean, it's inevitable that you imagine things as you read the script. I try very hard almost to not visualize the script because um, you don't, you know, you want to talk to the director and, and to get to the end of the script at least, but you want to talk to the director and get a sense of their vision first before you're too far on the wrong track. So, uh, I try not to lock in anything too early, but I often, when trying to talk to the director about the look, I, I play games of what I call visual contrasts, like, you know, do we lean wide angle telephoto, saturated, desaturated, warm, cold. It's just, and often it's tied to the narrative. Is this is this narrative a arc from A to B? So if it ends here, does it have to start at the other direction? Or is it a world building story where it says a contrast between A and B or A, B and C? So you're building a world for a character A and a world for character B and you're intercutting that. So that's all based on the structure of the script. Um, but in terms of Maisel, since this is the fifth season and you know, I've worked many times with Amy. Uh, it's more imagining what she's going to ask for as I'm reading it. You know, when are the big wonder sequences going to show up? Um, you know, and if it's on a set, we often shoot like the apartment set. I don't sweat it so much, but if it's a new set or a new location or or something like that, then I start looking at scouting from a in a 360 degree point of view, like. What if I have to start outside the street and go through the door and go up the stairs and do 360? You know, how am I going to do that before just as to have that in my pocket? That's, that's like the subway scene in, in the, the season. You're just coming yeah. in and out of cars and stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, John, how about you? Because the, before you were talking about like how you, you were so inspired after meeting Cinco for Schmigadoon. Yeah. Yeah, well, I I think what I love about, uh, I love pre-production too, and what I love about the process is hearing everyone's ideas. I mean, obviously, when I read a script, I have some sort of big ideas or, you know, like large ideas of, of generally how I think I could take the script. But then you go, and I love to go to all the meetings, like I love to go to the props meetings, I love to go to the costume meetings, because someone will say one thing that you can feed off of. And it's just so, it's so nice to feed off of everyone's ideas. And I think that's what I love so much about filmmaking. You've just got so many people putting their heads together and coming up with ideas. And then, and then I find too, once you, once you get to set and you see what actors do, you change even more, but you, you have sort of a general plan. But um, 
yeah, I like to, I, I, I like to have a plan, but I like to feel how things play out on set. And I find uh, a lot of times things happen naturally, or there's uh, things you just see on the moment, but definitely going in with a strong plan is good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Christian, how about you? Yeah, I think, you know, I think David said it best that, you know, it sort of depends on if it's a new project or if, it's, if you're returning to the project, you know, this was our fourth season and, and we knew that we wanted to kind of approach it a little different. And so, you know, reading, reading the script, you know, we were all trying to think outside of the box and come up with some um, new ideas that we could sort of um, throw into the pod and, and uh, you know, the director and I, we sort of, break scripts down independently. And then we try to also then do like a fresh session where we break scripts down together and, and bring, you know, some ideas, some, you know, shots that we've seen or sequences that we maybe thought of while, while reading it our first time. And, and then it's, it's a good, a very organic, natural process. Um, uh, but yeah, I think sometimes, you know, when you have a new script, uh, it, it's, it, for me, it, it's different each time. It, it depends on the way the script is written and, and the voice the script is written in and, and how descriptive it is or how much I, you know, my mind wanders while I'm reading it versus how, you know, uh, engaged I am. And uh, it's it's different each time. Mm -hmm. And Sean, how about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, echoing others here, I think to an extent you're, it's a practice of trying to uh, repress <laughs> any ideas you have right away because you don't want those to get in the way later on. Uh, and like David was saying, I, I like playing games with the directors too. Kind of, if, is it this or that all the time? Uh, just to kind of construct the edges of the swimming pool or the playground that we're all going to get into. So I kind of know, okay, I'm not going to go past this boundary. We sort of established that at least, you know, like let's start working on some of the other edges that are going to define the shape of this thing. And as Igor says, I think it's a, it is a long, I don't think I'm done prepping until like we're working on the last shot. You know, I think that you're discovering this show or these whatever we're working on um, all the way through the process. And sometimes you don't know, you know, even in those comparisons, looking at films only gets you so far or photography. A lot of times it's on the day, I'll look over to John and be like, oh, is this too dark? Do we cross a line? Are we going to get a call tomorrow? And it's like, no, we could go for it. So like, okay, here's a new boundary. And that defines, that shifts everything that came before it and everything that came after it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, finally, um, present company excluded. Have you watched something recently where you were just incredibly impressed or wowed by a shot or a scene? Uh, John, we'll start with you. I know you've watched everyone here, but can't name anyone yeah. here. <laughs> Oh, because I, I actually was going to uh, name David from Marvelous Mrs. Maisel because that <laughs> show constantly blows me away. And uh, that last, I mean, I'm amazed I, and I'm going to talk about him. I don't care that he's here. It's amazing that he can do such beautiful lighting yet move the camera so freely and so appropriately. I mean, that just, um, yeah, it really speaks to me, that show. And I'm constantly, and it's just, I, I get a lot of joy from watching that. So mm -hmm. okay. um, that's the one. Christian, are you going to break the rules too, or or no? I'm a rule breaker. Break the, I'm not a rule breaker. Come on, Christian. Uh, <laughs> there's a show called The Old Man that I'm very fond of. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, you know, in our in our strike downtime, I've been getting some really uh, good uh, catch up time with Criterion, and um, I just watched Chunking Express and showgirls in the same <laughs> sitting and uh i encourage everyone both of the criterion remasters of both of those movies are truly stunning really beautiful um and and also such like cultural staples of of that period of time in cinema that are really really fascinating to like revisit now you know 20 30 years later it's, it's cool mm -hmm. um igor yeah um I'm trying to think. I mean, I saw some uh, really interesting documentaries that were that were done uh, uh, incredibly. Uh, um, and um, one is uh, uh, Mexican uh, uh, filmmaker Tatiana uh, Cueza, and uh, her and her partner are making these like uh, documentaries that are 
uh, done in a way that you don't know if you're watching a documentary or a fiction film. And because the, 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 the lighting is incredible, the framing is impeccable. And uh, it's, uh, it's just like, I, I was just moved by how, how this is recreated and done. I don't know exactly what they've done, but um, it, was, it was really impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, Anastas, what about you? Oh, um, I went to see Oppenheimer in mm -hmm. on a large screen with probably 500 other people. And it just brought back the love of cinema. And in the hands of a master between Hoyt and Chris, I mean, it's just masterful storytelling all the way through. Three hours sitting and we all got because uh, it's great to actually share that commonality of storytelling and, and be part of an audience and have everybody's heart thump the same way at the same time in the same room. So yeah, Oppenheimer, uh, two thumbs up. Yes, definitely. it was a quick three hours too, which it's not. Oh, usually. absolutely! <laughs> no, it's it goes. No, it's a it's a masterful bit of pacing mm -hmm. and storytelling. Masterful, definitely. Um, Sean, how about you? Uh, I was going to call out uh, Mr. David Klein. Uh, we were kind of partners in crime uh, last year for uh, Skeleton Crew for it's kind of a Star Wars spinoff, and and that I had done some volume work previously but really cut my teeth, you know, spending a year on one of those stages and, uh, and just now it's kind of getting through the last um, few episodes of the season three of Mandalorian. And I think he has such, a, I mean, it's, it's like everything, it's a new tool in the toolbox and there's, there's pluses and minuses and there's times to use it and not. And, uh, and he has been working with it really since its inception and, and it's just masterful work. It's, it's really inspiring and knowing how hard it actually is to do. I love that people think it's like cheap and easy. It's anything but, uh, but yeah, it's really, really cool stuff in there. And David, what about you? Well, in terms of it, I just recently watched uh, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, which was a 1960s oh. movie that Ozzy Morris shot. And uh, I hadn't seen it in decades. I forgot how how grim and sad that film was, but it's it's a great piece of filmmaking and black and white cinematography. And then just, I stumbled across a very little indie film on, I think it was like Freebie or something called The Color Room. It's just a period film about uh, a true story about a woman potter in uh, England in 1930s and Denson Baker from Australia shot it. And it's just gorgeous period lighting. Uh, every time she went into the uh, the color room, which is the room where they keep all the colored jars of chemicals for, for pottery work, he, did this beautiful colored flaring from the windows and the, and the pots in the room and it's so subtle uh i couldn't figure out quite how he did it i actually had to email him and talk to him about it oh it's, it's a very beautiful beautiful little uh period film that's awesome i mean that's gotta be like the biggest compliment when you get you know <laughs> like someone is, is interested in your work wants to know how you did it so um well we unfortunately have to wrap but congratulations again on all of your shows and your nominations it's great speaking with all of you and have a great day Thank you. Thank you for Thank having you me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.